Hello and welcome to our fifth Suffrage Centennial Book Club. My name is Regina Vitolo and I'm a reference librarian at Lone Star College Scyther Library. Today, I am honored to have reference librarian Bronwyn Sutherland with us to discuss Suffrage Women's Long Battle for the Vote by Ellen Carroll Du Bois. Um, if this is your first time attending one of our Suffrage Centennial Book Clubs, we are recording and all attendees will be muted until our Q&A and discussion section at the end of the presentation. If you have any questions in the meantime, please feel free to type them into the chat box or the Q&A box. Um, and just as a reminder, this recorded discussion will be available um, at a later time on our Suffered Centennial LibGuide page. Uh, if you have any questions, once again, please type them in the chat box or the Q&A box, and we will address those questions at the uh, end of the presentation portion of the discussion. Now I'm gonna go ahead and turn the floor over to reference librarian and our guest facilitator, Bronwyn Sutherland. Um, hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, like Regina uh, said, uh, I'm my name is Bronwyn Sutherland. I'm one of the reference librarians at SciFair Library, and I'm looking forward to our discussion of um, Ellen Carroll Dubois' uh, book, Suffrage, uh, the Women's, Women's Long Battle for the Vote. Um, my presentation isn't going to be uh, super long. I just wanted to pull in or highlight some of the more, more interesting interesting um, factoids or themes that I found within the book, which I hope will generate some discussion afterwards. Um, so one thing, oh, sorry, so next slide. I'm forgetting that I can't control my slides. Sorry. Okay, so um, one thing um, that I, I found out actually after I read this book, I don't, I don't know if this was mentioned in the book at all. I don't think it was. Um, but the term, the, the, the problem with the term suffragette, uh, which is one that uh, some people use, in fact, Hillary Clinton has been uh, known to use this, this word, uh, suffragette, and it is problematic. Um, Regina, if you could uh, click on that um, slide, I think I have some transitions in there. So if you click it again, I think it will put a line through suffragette. Okay, good. Okay, so suffragette was actually a derogatory term um, that was used by suffragists detractors. Um, and it was a term that was made up by English journalists in 1906 to belittle um, the suffragists and their uh, their movement. Um, and of course the correct term is suffragist. Uh, it is a little bit more difficult to pronounce, but um, it is uh, the, you know, it, it's the, the term that's most appropriate for for suffragists. Um, so you can see uh, on the right hand side, I have a, um, it's a, basically a postcard from this era, probably from uh, sometime maybe in 1910, 1911 or so, but um, you can see uh, the caption on the upper left hand corner says, everybody works, but mother, she's a suffragette. Um, so this was a term that was used um, you know, in a derogatory um, way. Um, so yeah, so next slide. Okay, so one of the more interesting uh, aspects of, of this, the, the suffrage uh, movement, I thought, was the influence, I'm not sure if this was touched on in the book either, but um, the influence of Native American women um, on the suffragists' um, attitudes toward, uh, you know, their striving for, for suffrage. And one of these was the Iroquois women um, they were a matriarchal society of, um, of women who lived, I believe it was, a, uh, I think those, those tribes were from upstate New York and various other areas around there, but they influenced the Euro-American women um, because they had a society in which their, the clan mothers were the ones who elected their tribal chiefs. Um, they advised the tribal chiefs after they were elected and they were able to remove tri tribal chiefs from their positions. In fact, if any of the tribal chiefs had been found to ever have abused a woman or a child, they were automatically, um, you know, removed from their position. They were not allowed to have a leadership role within the tribe, um, which, you know, so women and children were very protected um, in their society. Um, they had ownership over their lives, their possessions and their children um, in a way that Euro-American women did not. And so there, um, there are a lot of interesting um, 
So there are a lot of historians that are doing some interesting research and writing around this uh, this issue of how Native American women actually inspired Euro American women um, to pursue um, suffrage. So I thought that was interesting. Okay, next slide. Okay, so another really interesting theme that I thought that came up in this book was were the talking about themes around race um, and the temperance movement and the suffrage movement. Um, there were there were a number of African American women who were very active um, in this, um, you know, in the fight for for suffrage, uh, for women's suffrage. One of them was Ida B. Wells, um, but there were many others as well. Ida B. Wells, uh, as an example, she clashed um, most notably with Frances Willard. Um, they um, were on a, 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 a speaking circuit um, in, I think it was in London, around the same time. And Ida B. Wells criticized Frances Willard for not bringing up the issue of um, the treatment of African Americans um, in her talks. Um, and so there was a lot of tension here. It just it, to me, it was it's a really interesting um, kind of area of, of when we're looking at women's suffrage, how race kind of you know entered into the equation. Um, so, and this is a quote from Willard here. Willard was uh, also involved in the temperance movement. I think she may be trying to remember. I think she was temp like that was her primary um, interest. Um, I think. Um, so her, she's asserting in her quote that, you know, that African-Americans, uh, you know, reproduce, you know, in a, in a, you know, they, they reproduce there, you know, there are lots of them and that they are the ones that are responsible for producing, um, you know, alcohol in uh, what she calls the grogs, the grog shops. So, you know, so there was a lot of tension there between you know, people who were involved in the temperance movement and the suffrage movement and African-American women who were fighting for, um, you know, just fighting for African-Americans rights, you know, in general. So, yeah, so I thought that was a really interesting um, kind of theme throughout the book. Um, okay, so next slide. Oh, and here's another, Belle Kearney. Um, she was a suffrage leader in Mississippi, and she's the one I thought this is another kind of playing in with the race thing. Um, at that time, I think, well, there was a time, and, I, and Regina is the story person, the historian here, so she can kind of fill us in on this. But uh, I, I believe at this time it was, it was one, th so every African American who lived in the South, that was one third of a vote. Um, and so to give, um, African Americans the right to vote as a full person. They would, you know, each African American man would have one vote instead of one third of a vote, which is, you know, uh, what it was before. So um, basically, what um, Bel Kearney is saying here is that if they gave women, white women, the right to vote, that would offset the political uh, representation that black men would have um, if they granted black men the right to vote. So that was another kind of conflict in the suffrage movement um, where white women were sort of, uh, some white women uh, were, you know, trying to make this kind of, you know, spurious argument that if you give us, if you give us the right to vote, it's better for white people in the long run politically. Okay, all right, next slide. Let's see what else I put in here. Oh, okay. And there was also, I thought was really interesting was this um, tension between sort of more militant, um, more militant methods uh, and pacifist methods. Um, so Alice Paul um, was definitely the more militant activist, whereas Carrie Chapman Catt, she was the NASA president. She favored a more pacifist kind of approach. Um, to uh, the suffrage movement, and they clashed. They didn't agree on um, on how the how how the right should be won. Um, and so, but Alice, I mean, I, I I would interpret that as Alice Paul was ultimately her methods were ultimately more effective because uh, it was her efforts uh, to in large part that led finally to uh, the amendment being passed. 
but you know she she was definitely um she used a lot of methods that would be considered um you know somewhat aggressive controversial you know she um petition or she uh, could you go to the next slide really quick she um embarrassed the president during a war during wartime by picketing and and things like that during that time which was really uh, very embarrassing to the u.s president at that time chapman cat didn't believe in that kind of uh, approach uh, she thought that they should be more polite about it um alice paul also went to prison and uh, went on hunger strike and was force fed which was a horrible horrible process and drew a lot of attention and i'm sure chapman cat probably thought that was just a uh, very unseemly um and uh you know just kind of a, a an ugly way to go about things but in, eventually it did get results so so that was kind of another theme within the book that i saw you know were more militant methods and more pacifist methods okay and next slide okay so and this is the last thing that i wanted to bring which i thought was really interesting i wanted to I wanted to look into a little bit of what the anti suffragists were, were, what were their arguments? Uh, what were they? Why did they oppose women having the right to vote? Um, so it, it's interesting, and I think it ties in somewhat with the um, temperance movement as well, because women who um, oppose the right to vote, they seem to, they, they embodied this idea that women kind of had this moral authority. Um, and by relegating their role strictly to the home and child care, um, that they could have the most positive moral influence on their children. And so in that role, they were happy to relinquish their power um, to their husbands. But I think, you know, in, in some ways, the temperance movement was a way to sort of tame their masters. Um, because as they were happy to be in a secondary kind of, you know, uh, submissive role to men, they also wanted the men to behave themselves. And so I just thought that was kind of an interesting interplay of different um, different concerns and different, you know. But anyway, so this is interesting. This is a pamphlet um, that was put out by the anti, um, basically anti-suffrage movement at that time. Um, and you can see uh, what their arguments are. 90% of women do not want it and they don't care. Um, there was also this idea that women just didn't have the mental capacity to be able to be informed about political matters and make an informed decision when they did vote. Um, and there was also the idea that their vote was useless because they would only be voting along with their husband. And so it would just create, it would be more costly. You know, they would have to have more pull i guess more polling stations and it would just add more cost to a process that at the end was futile because they were only gonna vote right along with their husbands um so and then there's you know they would place the government under petticoat rule um so i, I just think i think their arguments are, are very interesting and uh the last slide this is really uh funny this is a <laughs> This is a, a combination, like a mashup of sort of household hints around the house, plus sort of like reasons why women should be disinterested in um, in suffrage. And they like put a little bit of a humorous spin on it as well, which I just think is so, it's just so interesting. Um, so like, for example, um, good cooking lessens alcoholic craving quicker than a vote. Um, Let's see, common sense and common salt applications stop hemorrhage quicker than ballots. So it's really, they're really trying to work some, you know, tongue in cheek humor in, into, their, into their arguments that, you know, women have no interest, no capacity uh, for gaining the right to vote and they're better off staying in their place in society and politically, so. Um, so yeah, I really enjoy. I, I kind of enjoyed reading these arguments that these women, that these anti suffragists had as well, because I think it gives good insight into, you know, what people were arguing about back then uh, in this regard when it came to suffrage. So, so that's. I just wanted to bring in, you know, a few other little, um, you know, interesting aspects to the whole story. So I just wanted to share that, and that's really all I've got. Um, 
I, I found the book to be very, very interesting, definitely very comprehensive. You got, you know, like an entire, um, you know, uh, it just goes from start to finish. So very comprehensive overview. Um, I guess uh, to start off the um, discussion, I guess my one question for everybody would might be which which of the um, women um, and the activists outlined in the book did you find the most compelling or the most interesting? And was there any one of these? Were there any one of the activists that you would have maybe enjoyed reading a bit more about? And I just want to throw in there. Ron, what I'm going to tell you. Um, if you would like to comment or answer one of the questions, go ahead and just, as a reminder, type it into the chat box or the Q&A box, or you can use the raise your hand function, and I will unmute you so you can answer the question if you'd like to speak or pose your own question. Um, Bronwyn, I know you just asked your question, but I wanted to throw in there, um, in Ellen Carol Dubois, in her book, she brings this up, the contradictions among the arguments that anti-suffragists um, often presented. So um, one argument is that women would not care about voting, would, didn't care about politics. And then another argument is that too many women would vote and uh, they, you know, we would be under petticoat rule. So I think it's, it's so interesting reading through these anti-suffrage uh, pamphlets and arguments and the, the cartoons to see all of those contradictions. It's hilarious. So, mm. I mean, absolutely really funny. Yeah. Yeah. And I feel like, you know, this wasn't touched on in the book, uh, to my knowledge, but I feel like uh, or what it was, but Christianity had to factor hugely into, into all of this. And I feel like that was kind of an under, there's an underlying current um you know of that it's never explicit i mean it's definitely not explicitly talked about in this pamphlet or in any other the, of the anti-suffrage materials that i saw um, when i was looking around but you know that had to factor uh, well, quite a bit it's i know in the book um it's interesting that uh we hear about elizabeth Cady stanton and um her displeasure with with the the preachers and the churches, uh, the ministers who were actively preaching and advising their congregations against women's suffrage. And the same way that they, they used the Bible to support slavery in the South, they used the Bible to, um, to preach against women's suffrage and the evils and perils of uh, giving women their full rights as American citizens. So that's mm -hmm. something interesting that uh, the author does touch on in this book as well. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I think you're right. When we're reading through these anti-suffrage, the anti-suffrage propaganda and pamphlets, um, we don't read a lot of, like, it, it's not directly in the in those um, those artifacts about the role religion plays into the anti-suffrage movement, but. Um, I mean, when we look at the temperance, the temperance movement, we see more of that religious aspect in those overtones um, in their, I guess, in their their pamphlets or propaganda or arguments. So that mm -hmm. is interesting. Um, and I'm sorry yeah. to detract from your first question. If you want to go ahead and ask that again, and if anyone wants to raise their hand or type in the chat box, go for it. Yeah, I just feel like she covered a lot. Um, you know, she she traversed a lot of territory and she touched on a lot of, you know, there were a lot of little mini biographies in there. I mean, she touched on a lot of people and I was just wondering if there was anyone who kind of stood out. Um, you know, for me, for example, it was Ida B. Wells. She really, reading about Ida B. Ida B. Wells really, uh, she totally sparked my interest and imagination uh, because she just comes off as a complete, wow, just amazing amazing woman she showed a lot of courage and um yeah i would you know so that was somebody who really stuck out to me and i'm just wondering if there's if anyone else had that experience of you know uh reading about one of the uh, you know the figures in the book that really sort of stood out to them or inspired them or made them more curious and while we're waiting for anyone to type in their comments 
Um, I want to say that um, Ida B. Wells is such a fascinating figure because when you think of the um, how brave she was to speak out not only for women's rights and for racial equality, but against lynchings in the South. Um, you know, she is she she was a passionate uh, orator, a writer, an activist, and when we look at when we look at let's say Alice Paul or Lucy Burns, we see they they were fearless in their um, in their activism and in their uh, protesting for women's rights. And yet, I don't think they really had to worry about their um, their lives being threatened because of uh, being threatened by violence. Whereas Ida B. Wells, she was she was just as passionate and outspoken as suffragists like Alice Paul, but um, she also had to, had that fear hanging over her head of being lynched herself for speaking out. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah, would I, you say that, would you say that African American women activists at this time, would you say that there was an added sort of level of courage that they had to occupy, you know what I mean, in order to speak right. <laughs> from the platforms that they did uh, it was compounded you know their exactly you know the situation was really calling on them to be courageous whereas i guess for white women you know yeah they 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 had to display the courage of speaking against the masses you know because it was you know but they didn't have the added the added the compound factor of race you know as well so that's right. what, I mean, and so that's why Ida B. Wells really stuck out to me because I I just found her courage to be really um, particularly well, inspiring. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, yeah. So I I think the author did a great job of um of showing the ties and the different influences uh, that the the abolitionists and the abolition movement had on the the women's uh, rights movement. Um, and I think in one of the reading from the introduction, what, one of the things uh, she writes is, nor was it true that women's suffrage movement was voiced exclusively by and in the name of white women and that deep seated racism was its fatal flaw. For much of its history, the demands for women's suffrage and black suffrage were bound together but that statement must be carefully parsed. So um, in the introduction of this book, which I, it, she did a fantastic job writing the introduction, but, um, and then throughout the first, uh, you know, five chapters or so, we kind of see this argument for, um, in defense of Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Um, a lot of the, the current, a lot of research over the past few years that's been written or articles or, you know, things printed in the press highlight um, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, or they, they, they point out that she, that she was racist or that the early women's rights movement was, was racist. But in mm -hmm. fact, um, it's, there's so much more nuance to that. We see that uh, in this book that you, Susan B. Anthony, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, uh, Lucretia Mott, they, Lucy Stone, they are all pushing for universal suffrage. They want, you know, black enfranchisement as much as women's enfranchisement. But so many things occur and unfold that we see this boiling point for Katie Stanton, where she ends up devolving and using these, you know, nativist racist arguments to keep the you know women's rights in the picture when she feels like they are being pushed out of the picture because of um, uh, because of the abolitionists and mm. the, the issue with slavery. So um, yeah, so it's like political bargaining, right? You know, you you have to maybe sacrifice your principles and what you may feel inwardly to advance your political agenda. Right. Right. I guess. Yeah. So, and that must I mean, have been a very hard, I mean, I imagine it must have been really difficult for some of those women like, like Katie Stanton to, to have to do that, you know? So 
don't know. I mean, I just I wonder, like, what do, what do you think? What do you how do you think the movement would have progressed had had they, you know, had they melded those two movements, suffrage, you know, suffrage, uh, the movement for suffrage, uh, women's suffrage and universal suffrage, you know, and, um, you know, how, I mean, how would it have gone if they'd kind of stuck to their principles, do you think? Would, have, would it have just floundered? Well, in, in the comments here, uh, Rachel Hugenberg she she answered that question she said it would have gone a lot faster but the reality of it was that it, it wasn't moving forward it wasn't in advancing faster for the women's side of the argument um that's that's part of what troubled elizabeth katie stanton she saw the um she saw the black men being enfranchised um she saw that happening before you know, women being enfranchised or um, so the idea of that. So they were, you know, going for this universal suffrage platform, but it wasn't working. So that's why we ultimately see, you know, this split in the movement between abolitionists and a women's uh, the women's rights activists. So, um, mm. you know, and but we see this demonstrated throughout history. It's like you're going for one a broad um, you're wanting to enfranchise everyone, but we often see that things are done piecemeal because they're, things stagnate, things do not move forward. So we end up having to settle for, you know, bargain one thing first, and then so many years later, something else gets passed, like we see with the Voting Rights Act. So, um, right. I, I mean, if they had stuck the course, for universal suffrage or if Katie Stanton had said, you know, we are going to completely throw our support behind um, male black enfranchisement and advocate for that. I don't I don't know that that would have um, pushed the agenda for women's rights forward um, soon after that. They may have had to, you know, they and as it as it was, we you know, it was decades before um, even African-Americans were fully enfranchised. So it's hard mm -hmm. to, it's hard to say how that would have gone. Yeah. And I, and I guess that the like Bell Kearney, like that was an extreme form of bargaining in which she said, hey, if you give us the vote, then black men, you know, we, we in fact, in effect, we we're going to cancel out African-American man's vote. You know what oh, I mean? That's right. like, yeah. So, and then, um, Going back to one of your slides in your earlier statements, um, I think you were referring to the three fifths compromise and where the right. South, it was feared that the South was gonna have, you know, the South already had more political power because, you know, they counted the votes for, um, I guess, out of every five. Three, yeah, three fifths political. of a vote. I'm sorry, right. I think I said one third, I'm right. sorry. <laughs> no, that's okay, I get that confused too, but that, you know, um, referencing that in the fear of, um, that that was another that was something on people's minds and we have to remember the early women's rights movement and even in the progressive era um it was it was very regional you know southern women weren't talking about women's rights um as early as you know the north the northeast and the midwest so when when the civil war comes around and um finally you know with the the 14th and 15th amendment the south is starting to think about the their political weight and how it's going to change um change the political landscape if you have you know all of these freed slaves or freed black men who are able to vote and have a say in in the laws of the land so i think um I think she does the the author does a great job of really delving into that and i have to say i found that the first half of the book was the most interesting to me because um while she's discussing what's going on with the women's rights movement and the abolitionists and the temperance movement um we're also getting this broader history of just politics in general in in the united states and i i find the um when we what we see how we see the women's rights movement um, 
in a lot of the time we think it stalled during the Civil War, but I think they they gained a lot of ground on a more granular level during the Civil War. Um, I, I'm curious if anyone else thought like thought about that or found that part interesting, um, especially when we read about Elizabeth Cady Stanton and um, when she uh, when they move they go to Kansas and her experience in Kansas and the discussion of the Kansas Nebraska Act. That was all very fascinating to me. And I'm I'm curious if anyone else was, uh, you know, um, found that part of the book more fascinating than the, the second half. Or why, um, why was this uh, movement, I mean, I guess you could say that it was more successful in the West. I mean, the push was, it was definitely among pioneer, you know, populations or whatever, it was definitely more accepted than it was in the East. Uh, and that's interesting to me. You know, why, why did people embrace uh, this movement so much more in the West than they did back East? And, I mean, in the book, she does point out that, um, you know, the pioneer life or expanding mm -hmm. into this new virgin territory uh, in in the West, in the Midwest, um, women had, women were hardened. Women had to, and they were forced into doing the same types of, of things for survival that that men were. So it was more of an equal partnership. Uh, although you could say that women with, you know, especially women who um, had, you know, had the experience pregnancy on the trail or raised kids on the trail, and they were also having to help in other ways, you know, um, may have had even more of a burden. But I mean, that definitely plays into it. Uh, just as we see uh, during, you know, during the world wars, um, in the Civil War, we see women assuming new roles and um, taking uh, a bigger part in public life because the men are fighting on the battlefield. Uh, we see that, you know, with the pioneers and, um, and in the West. So that definitely plays into it. I wonder, I mean, this is just an idea, but I, I also wonder maybe if they were, I mean, there are a lot of factors involved, but I wonder if there was some influence by Native Americans um, and their sort of societal structure, you know, on these people who who journeyed west, um, and they're that much further removed from sort of the establishment, um, you know, and and being surrounded by native tribes and their way of life. I just wonder if that might have been a factor. I think that was a big factor, and uh, we and Elizabeth Cady Stanton writes about that in letters and in journals about the influence um, that Native Americans and their uh, matriarchal societies had on, you know, how she envisioned citizenship for women, for American women. Um, so I think that definitely played a played a big role. Mm -hmm. So for those of you who are are here for the discussion today, did anyone have a um, a favorite part of the book? For those of you who were able to read the book, um, did you find yourself more interested in the first half or the second half. If you've read any of the other books for Suffrage Centennial Book Club, how did this book compare to the others you may have read? And I'll start by saying, um, this book and Tina Cassidy's book have probably stood out stood out as my favorite books as far as the ground they cover and um, and the the um, you know these books are they are rigorously researched and um, both authors are able to present this this research in such detail in such a compelling way um and i realize i may be biased but for for suffrage but suffrage and um tina cassidy's mr president how long must we wait i tore through those books and um suffrage i originally listened to as an audiobook when it first came out 
And then this past week, I was trying to refresh my memory and go through the book again. And um, I was caught up in it all over again. So um, for me, definitely, I would recommend Suffrage by Ellen Carroll DuBois to someone who is just now getting interested in women's history or wants to learn more about women's suffrage and doesn't have a lot of um, you know, background knowledge about it, I definitely recommend uh, this book. What about you, Bronwyn? How did you feel compared to the others? Uh, I really, I, I can say I, I enjoyed Cassidy's book um, a little more than this one. And uh, just because I kind of enjoy that sort of more specific, uh, pers you know, that more specific uh, uh, perspective of you're looking at a particular relationship, you know, in that case, we were looking at the relation, you know, or the interaction between Alice Paul um, and the president at that time. And, um, you know, I just I enjoyed that it was more of a biopic. Um, and so I, I just find for me, that's a little more compelling. Um, I feel like, I mean, this was a very good book and it definitely gave you a great in, um, a great overview of the entire journey, um, but she was biting off a lot. And I just, I, I was kind of finding myself, you know, thinking mm, I would have really liked to have read something that was a little more focused, um, you know, and it, it fired up the imagination a little bit more. That's just, but that's just my personal perspective like after reading this I you know I, I my mind was going all these different directions about like you know different like you know areas that you could look into for example you know looking more into IW, IW Wells and different I was more I became more interested in certain figures as a as a result of reading this book so that was kind of my take on it I mean she covers a lot of ground you know so the, I mean I think you bring up a good point um so this might be a good starter book for those who are interested in learning more about the women's suffrage movement um, because they'll come like you did they'll come across historical actors that they want to do some more research on so mm -hmm. i think for that all of the the different historical actors in the movement that she presents i think it's useful for that if you um if you read this to get a broad overview and then pick one of these you know, uh, one of these characters to go and do some more focused research on and um, like for with Alice Paul or Ida B. Wells, for instance. Um, and there's another interesting aspect of this as well is the sort of the role of, uh, I mean, the role of sexuality. You know, when we're talking about these women. They just a lot of them dispensed with, you know, they dispensed with marriage. They gave up that part of their lives. And, you know, I think many of them probably were you know, we're gay. And so I feel like that's an area that hasn't maybe been explored too much. I don't know. I mean, like, you know, but that's another kind of interesting area, you know, to an, a different angle to look at things from. You know what I mean? Well, I can't remember if she mentions this or not, but um, it's like the idea of um, the the phrase that we use was used or is used is a Boston marriage. A lot of these these women um, you know, chose not to get married because they did not want to give up their, you know, they wanted to hold on to the rights they did have as, as single women. Um, and they ended up, you know, to survive living with other women. And they developed these incredibly close, you know, these attachments that sometimes were described as um, romantic attachments without, without being conjugal. So, um, and if you if you want to do a little more research on that later about um, look into the phrase of Boston marriage, it, it kind of delves into that a little more. But um, it's that it's almost, you know, women were forced into having these not forced, but it was a better alternative for them to develop these incredibly close and intense relationships with other women and live with them than to give up their personhood to enter you know, a marriage to a man before they are, they were um, granted, you know, uh, mm -hmm. the vote. So that's another interesting aspect that she touches on in this book. Um, mm -hmm. And the fact that I, I was reading an interesting article in the New York Times, an interview, um, and some uh, scholars were talking about the fact that, I mean, in their opinion, Alice Paul was asexual. Like she just, the woman had no life, you know, let alone no lo love life, you know. Um, so I just think that's interesting how that 
whole thing plays plays into well, her her life you know yeah her her she dedicated completely dedicated her life to to the cause of you know equal rights for women and securing mm -hmm. the vote and um w when i read things you know commenting on the lack of of a love life or personal life of alice paul i also think you know she she wasn't vocal about her personal life we only know what we see what we see or read in the headlines from the press at the time um and then you know some of the uh the recorded interviews of her in her late life but i mean who knows there could have been someone we don't really know anything about her sexuality um but it's just that the information it's just not there unless someone has yet to uncover a secret cache of, of letters or a journal that you know um hasn't been you know made public yet so mm -hmm. um i think but i think anytime speaking of, and with politics in general any i think she knew this anytime you have some kind of romantic scandal or your romantic relationship people tend in, in the press and in, in the media they tend to hyper focus on that you know so if mm -hmm. Alice Paul had been in a marriage or seeing someone which it's you know it's hinted at in uh the film iron jawed angels that she has you know some kind of romantic um i don't know i guess kind of a relationship with the with the reporter or i can't remember if it was a reporter but it's it's hinted at that she did have her sexuality is you know it's hinted at in that film iron dog angels but um i think she was savvy and she she was smart she knew that if she was public with her romantic or personal life that was going to overshadow what she was working for because that's that's what it, you know that's what the media tends to focus on and people tend to gravitate towards this, you know. Mm -hmm. They would have taken it. taken interest away from her right. message. Yeah. And she knew that. Um, but then I think she was also very guarded. She, as we see with the early um, women's rights pioneers, um, but you know, Elizabeth Cady Stanton is not a great example because she had she had help with her with her children from dedicated friends and she was still able to, you know, work tirelessly for the movement. But there were other women who worked tirelessly for the movement, and then they ended up getting married to someone they met in the abolitionist movement or um, in their public speaking circuit. And then they had kids and they had to stop all of their public and political work. So I think she was aware of those those dangers and she may have been guarded. Um, romantically speaking so did anyone else have any um any comments about uh ellen carol dubois writing style or the, her narrative style the way she presented this broad you know history of the women's movement i'm curious to know if people who actually had a chance to read the book or part of it um engaged with her writing style and i i don't see anyone typing in the chat but i i did want to mention because it is uh if um uh it's international education week and ellen carol dubois she has published a ton of research on uh women the women's rights movement globally so if you enjoyed her writing, I do recommend visiting her website or accessing the library's databases um, in JSTOR or Academic Search Complete, for instance, and looking up some of her articles on um, women's suffrage uh, in, in New Zealand or in other parts of the world, or you know, just women's rights in general, the movements, the uh, global movements. And um, so she has a lot of great re research that's not just focused on American women's suffrage. So I recommend that if you enjoyed her writing and you engaged with it. Bronwyn, did you have any other parts of the book that stood out for you? Um, 
I mean, I, I, I just found, I found the entire, the whole interplay between the temperance movement and the, and the suffrage movement kind of fascinating. Um, you know, I just, I found that whole part of it interesting. Um, I, I found it interesting actually just learning about what women's you know what what women's lives were like then and the fact that they had to subsume so many of their freedoms and rights under the under the you know the protection of their husbands and when they married they just signed over everything you signed over your rights to your children if you got divorced you know your children belong to your husband i mean it's amazing to me to to read about to read about that i mean i think that was um that was that was interesting for me. Um, and, you know, they weren't only fighting for the right to vote. They were fighting for, you know, just to have agency over their lives, you know. That's so, awesome. yeah, they had a it was a it was a big mountain to climb. Right. So, yeah, I think it, it, it was interesting to read um, about the the different views that Sojourner Truth had and Frederick Douglass had when it came to like, if we have to choose giving black men the vote first or giving women the vote first or universal suffrage, um, you know, from 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 what we read, it seems that Sojourner Truth and the research that um, the authors presented here, she identified with being a a woman first before just being for before being um, black. And Frederick Douglass, he ultimately had to argue that you know race before gender so it was more important to enfranchise um black men than it was first you know than it was for, for women to to get the right to vote first and um and it's you know famously uh in one of his speeches he's giving um when we we see the split you know the split on stage between frederick Douglass and the abolitionist movement and his support for um women's suffrage and Elizabeth Cady Stanton and, um, you know, a woman from the audience, you know, when he's making his case for throwing all support and going full steam ahead for enfranchising the black men, um, a lady from the audience, you know, shouts something like, well, you know, there are black women too. <laughs> so, um, and, and then Frederick Douglass, you know, remarks that yes, but, um, it's you know race race still comes first so um for him i think he was kind of forced in that position and it's really sad when you when you look at the and when you read any of the articles or if you've read frederick douglas um his letters or um his his articles and it's this this split between the abolitionists and the women's rights movement it was something that was in a sense conjured up by the media and politicians they they wanted they all wanted universal suffrage and then they were forced to you know pick one or the other um and i mean we see this happen throughout history with different movements or even with politics today with you know the left and the right um the the role that the media plays in creating these antagonisms between these movements who ultimately have the same goal for for equal rights for equality and mm -hmm. so for me it was interesting it's always interesting to see the the like the role that the media and the press plays in creating a lot of these these problems so mm -hmm. any and, comment yeah. about that yeah that's something that we see today <laughs> as well yeah I mean, you see, I saw a lot of things in the book that we still, a lot of the arguments, so you can look at the anti-suffragist arguments and still see remnants of that in, in, in today's culture. Right. So. So, um, does, does anyone have any uh, last thoughts or comments before we go ahead and wrap up today's discussion? If so, please feel free to use the raise your hand icon or leave a comment. Oh, do you want to, sorry, um, Regina, do you want to advance the slide one more time? Because I think I included an image in the very, I forgot about this. Oh. Could you just click? Yeah, yeah. I forgot about this. <laughs> sorry. 
So this, I found this one, this is as a, this will work as just a last comment. This was a very interesting cartoon, I thought, the one on the left, uh, where we see like, you know, the woman, women are advancing, you know, they're, you know, they're moving toward their goal of political enfranchisement and all of this. And, and it comes at a cost, you know, and that's depicted in this, in this uh, cartoon here, which I think is, you know, I just think it, it's just interesting. And I think also we were talking, you know, I was talking about how we still see these themes played out uh, even today. I mean, we've just elected our first female vice president, um, you know, and I think you still, you still see that tension um, played out even now, you know, with women and uh, the fact that they alone have to make that choice between um, political enfranchisement and power and, you know, the very top of this thing, it says fame, you know, so the fact that they're sacrificing something or that society is somehow suffering in some way because of their advancement. So I, I found all of these really interesting, these cartoons that was, and the, the, the postcards and all of that, it was, um, I guess I'm a visual person. I, I really, I really enjoyed looking at all of those. So. One thing that's kind of interesting to me as well is you'll see in the middle of the step of the stair of the steps there it says artistic success. <laughs> Women weren't even allowed to be <laughs> artistically successful. You know, I just think that's I don't know, I just think that's really um interesting. You know, they weren't they were only seemed to be only fully women if they just completely gave themselves over to the home and children. I just, I just realized that I was on mute. Sorry about that, Bronwyn. No, that's okay. But what I was, um, in reference to your last comment with well, artistic success, we had women who were very successful in the arts, but they were using nom de plumes. They were publishing under male names. And, um, but yeah, so that's something else interesting. And, um, and what I was, what I was, you know, talking about um, while I was on mute is that <laughs> even, even though we, you know, we're commemorating the 19th Amendment, and even since, you know, the, the legislation from the, you know, the Voting Rights Act, um, we are still, we are still in this struggle of, of just of voting rights and everyone having, you know, full, um, realizing their full rights as. As citizens, uh, when we think about voter suppression in the book that we read for last month's book club, um, it's still an ongoing struggle. But um, one of the one of the best ways to to mobilize against things like voter suppression um, is to learn to know about your history, the history behind. Um, the tactics and strategies used to um, to secure the right to vote. And um, so I think that this book, especially, uh, is so important because it gives it gives you, you know, the the broad history of the struggle for the right to vote, not just for women's right, but for, you know, um, for minorities and uh, African Americans as well. So, I think that if you get anything from these books or attending the book club discussions, hopefully it will, um, you know, it's made you a more informed citizen and, and a voter. And uh, yeah, so um, I hope everyone 
learned something new from the discussion or from reading the book. If you did not have a chance to read the book, I do recommend the audiobook version. It was, um, it's it's a good audiobook to listen to, and of course, I recommend reading the book as well. I loved reading the book, and it's a great. I think it would be since we're on the holiday season, it would be a great gift for anyone um, you know that's uh, wanting to learn more about the women's support movement. I, um, I I have to bring up when I went to vote uh, earlier this month, two of the poll workers that I encountered, um, I, I, I wore a voting costume inspired by the cover of this book. And two of the poll workers that I encountered, they're both women, they, they had no idea that we were commemorating the 100 year anniversary of women's, of the 19th and women's right to vote. Um, so, I was a little taken aback, but I realized, you know, a lot of people have no idea about the, about, you know, the history, their history with voting, you know, and, um, and the struggles that, that, that people went through to gain uh, the right mm -hmm. to vote. So our, our history has always been a man's history. Right. And even now it's, it's, it's a masculine, it's, it's always bent toward the masculine, you know, and that's something I think that hopefully we can change right. in the coming decades. I'd like to see that. Yeah. And I think, and I think a lot of historians and activists and uh, scholars are, are changing, you know, doing a lot of recovery work and rewriting that story, which I kind of touch on in um, the next newsletter that will come out. But again, thank you all for attending. I'm going to go ahead and unmute Marsha Welsh. She has her hand raised. Marsha, you want to go yes. ahead and speak? Yes, I was just going to comment um, on this purple cartoon page. It says, what challenges still lie ahead? And those of us with daughters and granddaughters and maybe great granddaughters, um, you know, we need to talk about these things with them and let them be vocal about what they think. We had a small family get together and I felt like some of the older people like myself were still in the dark ages and the kids are listening to this. Mm. And, um, so that was just my kind of comment. I listened on to the book on audio about halfway through. I think I was kind of having voter and suffrage burnout. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry about that. But I've, I've learned so much and I love to hear you two talk about it. So thank you so much. That's all I wanted You're to welcome. say. Thank that's you a, so much for joining us. Yes, and that's oh, a great, yes, thank you. That's a great point you bring up. So everyone, if you are having virtual, you know, family get togethers for the holidays, or if you are going to visit family, um, you know, Marsha makes a great point about listening to to the the younger generations and hearing their thoughts and ideas about what's going on um, in the world today. So that's a, a great point you bring up. But thank you so much for attending us. Thank you for attending with uh, this discussion with us today. Thank you for everyone who has attended uh, all of our past discussions. If you have any questions, um, feel free to email after um, after we end today's meeting and just keep an eye on your inbox for the newsletter and the invitation for our sixth and final Suffrage Centennial Book Club, which will be in a little less than a month on December 15th. So please, you know, keep that in mind. And that's a much shorter book and it takes a look at a um, a different angle of the suffrage movement. It's Gilded Suffragists. So by Joanna Newman. Um, and it's it's an interesting look at, um, at the these New York socialites that played a key role in uh, pushing the women's the pushing for the Nineteenth Amendment, and they basically you know bankrolled the movement towards the end of it. So it's a fascinating read, and we hope to see you uh, on December fifteenth. Tell all of your friends and enjoy the rest of your week.